Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you're staying nice and warm wherever you may be and joining us. Um, my name is Bart Hamilton. I'm a professor here at the Olin Business School and research director of the Koch Center for Family Business. And on behalf of all of us at the Koch Center, I'd like to welcome you to our sixth annual Family Business Symposium sponsored by the Koch Center. Uh, this year's topic is the importance of culture in family business. Um, and I want to thank before we start, I want to thank the Koch family for supporting us and supporting this symposium. This is because of the uh, um, COVID situation. We're doing this conference virtually, obviously, and uh, this is the third of our sessions that we've had. So uh, looking at the importance of culture and family business. And two weeks ago, we heard from Subramanian Ramadore from Tata Consulting Services that talked about the Tata family culture that uh, emphasizes not just business success, but also the impact of their company and their family on Indian society as a whole, which is something I think many family business owners in the audience uh, can relate to because they have similar views and cultures vis-a-vis -vis their own communities here in St. Louis and elsewhere. Um, last week, we heard from Lisanne Dorian, who's a fifth generation member of the Bacardi family. And she talked about the culture at Bacardi that emphasize the development of human capital that has allowed Bacardi to weather a number of existential crises from expropriation in Cuba to becoming one of the leading brands in the world today. Um, and today uh, we're going to hear about a very unique uh, culture that has driven uh, amazing success in the financial services industry. Um, our speaker today is going to be George H. Walker, the chairman and CEO of Newberger Berman. Um, and just so you know uh, what our format uh, looks like, we'll have a one-hour directed discussion with Mr. Walker, um, moderated by Spencer Burke, our uh, Eugene F. Williams, Jr. Executive in Residence for Family Business here at the Koch Center. And then in the second hour, we're going to have a moderated panel discussion to reflect on uh, the thoughts and the ideas that uh, Mr. Walker shared with us. Uh, that panel discussion will be led by uh, Peter Baumgarten, who's the Koch family a professor of practice in family enterprise. And our panelists will include uh, David Eichhorn, CEO of NISA Investment Advisors, and Michael Deerberg, chairman of First Bank. Um, we're really grateful for that you can join us. Uh, we'd love to have you to participate. So you can see in the bottom of your Zoom uh, window, you can see a button that says Q&A. Uh, you should feel free to click on the Q&A button and write in any questions that you would like to have directed to our speakers and panelists. So uh, we look forward to a great session over the next two hours. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Spencer Burke, who will introduce Mr. Walker. Spencer? Oh, sorry, my great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you, Bart. Um, this is our third segment of our program on the importance of culture and family business, and uh, we're going to have a little change up this morning. We have the topic of learning about culture in an employee-owned firm. Many, many people view employee-owned firms as close cousins to family-owned businesses. In fact, many successful employee-owned firms have actually evolved from their family business roots, so they're particularly relevant in the family business context. This morning's conversation will be about culture at Newberger Berman, an 89-year-old, 100% employee-owned investment management firm based in New York, as related to us by its chairman and CEO, George H. Walker. Today, Newberger has assets of, under management of over 400 billion, over 2,300 employees and offices around the world. George has had a remarkable career in investment management. He was born and raised in St. Louis and earned his degrees at, at a master at a BA, BS, and an MBA at University of Pennsylvania. He spent 14 years with Goldman Sachs, rising to the rank of partner and co-head of its investment management division. 
In 2006, just in time for the financial crisis, which of course nobody knew about, he was lured away to Lehman Brothers to lead its wealth management effort. I'm gonna turn it over to George now and let George tell you a bit about his story and his journey, and also about his fabulous firm, Newberger Berman. George, welcome. Thank you, Spencer. Um, I'm struggling to start the video. It says the host has stopped it, but uh, um, perhaps there's, uh, oh, now I can start my video. Excellent. I've been told I have a face for radio. Your, your, your tech team would uh, uh, <laughs> show you my better attributes. Fun to be with you all uh, uh, today. Um, happy to, to, to talk about culture, which is, uh, which is incredibly important to us and has been uh, fundamental to whatever, whatever success uh, we've had. Uh, in terms of my own journey, I would only say as relates to participating in family owned businesses, I'm a case study in failure. Uh, I tried to work uh, with my dad a couple of times, uh, and it didn't work well. So uh, uh, <laughs> I uh, I'm a, uh, not uh, I'm a I'm a how not to do it, not a how to do it uh, person in the in the context of, uh, of family-owned businesses. And let, let me just share a few words about Newberger Berman. As uh, uh, most folks have no idea what it is, my my mother still thinks it's a, a fine Austrian law firm, but. Uh, uh, we've sent through a few slides that'll that'll help introduce it a little bit, and I think might facilitate the conversation. So, um, if we can uh, can run through those, that would that would be uh, that'd be terrific. Um, the firm was was founded uh, by a guy named Roy Newberger, uh, who who just passed away a few years ago at 107. He was uh, uh, when he passed away the oldest living New Yorker. He came back into the office at 106, which was uh, was quite extraordinary existed for the vast majority of its history as a, a private partnership. Uh, firm went public um, uh, uh, and was public uh, for about six years and then was purchased by Lehman Brothers. Um, it actually had a terrific run at Lehman and, and really flourished uh, there until the financial crisis, at which point uh, the employees repurchased, uh, repurchased the firm and today uh, remains gone back to its original roots as a as a private wholly owned investment management firm. So happy to happy to talk about public private sub um, differences, what's worked, uh, what what hasn't, to the extent that that's uh, useful. Um, next slide, Bobby. Um, uh, we're a global firm uh, today. Most of our new business comes from from outside the U.S. Uh, large presence in Europe, large presence in Asia. Uh, we're one of the first firms to, to uh, build a woofy in China, um, to the extent that's uh, that's of interest to folks. Happy to happy to talk about it as well. As you'll see, also the firm is is uh, roughly seventy percent uh, of the capital that we manage is for large institutions, um, large public funds, corporates, uh, foundations, and endowments, um, and then the the remainder is roughly equally split between uh, direct client relationships that we have. Uh, with, uh, with with wealthy individuals in, in uh, places where we're a product provider, essentially to uh, leading private banks and trust companies and, and brokerage houses. Uh, we manage uh, about uh, just over $300 billion in uh, public market securities divided amongst equities, uh, fixed income and hedge funds and now uh, approaching $100 billion in, um, in private markets, the largest chunk of which would be in, in private equity, the, the fastest growing chunk of which uh, would be in the private credit space. Uh, we've performed well over time, beating, beating peers and benchmarks, thank goodness, because that's the only reason we exist. Uh, happy to talk about you know our, our business principles and values that'll probably come out more in the, the context of the discussion. Um, you know our, our principles are, are, are straightforward, just six that our clients come first. Uh, we're really passionate about investing. Uh, we invest a lot in our, our people. We're very focused on the, this uh, notion of alignment and making sure that the alignment between firm and employee and client is a uh, uh, is a is a virtuous one, um, and that's something we 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 think is uh, is vital. Uh, focused on on innovation, and and we really think deeply about our culture 
Um, if we were to define what makes our culture different, um, we, we, we try hard to, to focus on authenticity uh, and collegiality. That having been said, uh, we really embrace challenging dialogue with one another, um, in, in part grounded by observations that we had uh, while we were owned by, by, by Lehman Brothers in terms of uh, more command and control uh, structures. Uh, you know, we want folks who are really passionate about investing, um, not not focused on sort of necessarily getting to the next rung or focused on on organizational hierarchy. And we've made uh, community engagement, civic engagement, uh, uh, an important value of the firm. And e each of those are meaningful and happy to talk about any of them to the extent that's that's useful. Uh, firm, again, 100 percent employee owned. Uh, you know, tremendous experience. So, so 99% of the assets today are, are managed by folks who've been in the, in the industry for, for, for 20 plus years. We have virtually no turnover um, and have had virtually no, no turnover amongst the, the um, uh, mid and senior level uh, investment uh, ranks. Uh, this focus on alignment, again, very important to us. So we all have invested a lot of money side by side with clients, about $4 billion. A uh, hundred percent of deferred compensation uh, at our firm is invested side by side uh, with clients, and we focus a lot on our culture. We've been pleased to, to finish first or second uh, in each of the past seven years in the, the best places uh, to work competition, usually uh, rivaling uh, uh, the folks at Blackstone um, uh, and a few other shops seem, seem to be our toughest competitor there. Uh, ESG, uh, incredibly important to us. We've invested a lot, uh, have, have been a leader uh, doing a lot on that score um, this year, particularly uh, in the area of engagement, uh, which, I'd, uh, which I'd be eager to talk about. Uh, innovation, sorry, I, uh, I apologize. My three-year-old son is coming to visit. Uh, um, uh, uh, we, we, we've, we've built an, a number of capabilities and have been innovative. Um, one, of the, um, one of the larger um, long short uh, efforts uh, in US equities, uh, it was our dial, excuse me, one sec, our dial, uh, our dial business um, where we're, we're purchasing um, GP stakes uh, from uh, uh, from leading private equity and hedge fund firms uh, that's been in the press recently. Um, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, hey, you're you're a family guy. There's nothing wrong with that. That's good. I know. No, I'd like to be with him, but he uh, uh, he uh, is eager to participate. Apologies. No, um, that's no problem. Uh, uh, our dial business, which I think will interest folks, it, it, as you may have seen, we've announced recently we're merging it with a firm called Owl Rock, uh, and it'll be going public uh, uh, via a, a SPAC into a company called Blue Owl that's going to be a real leader in the private equity space um, coming out of the, 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 the block with a market cap that's, for example, slightly larger than Carlisle. Um, so uh, it's been an important uh, development for us as well, but have, have, have built a number of uh, a number of important capabilities to us uh, over the course of the past decade. Uh, and finally, you know, just sort of how we measure ourselves, which I think is 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 really important. That which you you that which you measure, you know, speaks to to, to that which you're trying to achieve. So our own internal scorecard, we focus first on, are we delivering for clients, measuring ourselves versus the market and versus peers and making sure we're, we're significantly outperforming both over time. Uh, we measure how we're doing with clients. Are they, are they entrusting us uh, with their irreplaceable assets? Um, not because growth in and of itself is a goal, it's not, but, but if, if clients are, are pulling their money and, and not contributing, it's a, certainly a sign that things aren't, aren't going well. Uh, our financial performance, you know, is the firm on, on, on solid ground? Do we have a, a very, very conservative capital structure? Um, are people, you know, are folks staying? Uh, engagement and enablement, something I'm happy to talk a lot about. How do we, how do we measure the strength of our culture? Um, uh, and and, uh, and, and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, something that's incredibly important to us and that we've been been focused a lot on. And finally, are we continuing to uh, are we continuing to innovate? Um, 
in um, in markets that that uh, themselves are, uh, are 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 innovating. So that's that's what uh, when I present to to our employees, that's where I start and end um, each conversation. You know, this is uh, this is really our our our, our scorecard and our north star. George, that that's uh, that's impressive, and and uh, I should add that since you you were acquired out of the Lehman bankruptcy, uh, you've you've more than doubled, I guess, your your asset base. So you've had uh, a heck of a run here, and it's so impressive. I thought the audience would be intrigued by uh, that traumatic experience that you went through back in two thousand eight. Not not to relive all of it, of course, but just the. Um, the dynamic of, of, of extracting this team, which is, was pretty big and, and has stayed together remarkably, as well as your client base, it's very impressive. Uh, but, but extracting that out of Lehman and, and making this decision on, um, on going forward 100% employee owned. And I related to that as sort of the history of Newberger, since you've had all these long-term uh, employees, top performers, I mean, they, they've seen private partnership, they've seen public corporation, they've seen working for a, a financial supermarket, uh, and, and here you are sort of, uh, I'd say, back to your roots uh, as a private firm, employee-owned, thinking long-term. So maybe just a little bit on how, how it came about that you were able to acquire the firm, and there was some competition, as I've read. I um, actually saw the press release of Bain and & Company and Hellman Friedman announcing their deal. I said, what? I thought this didn't happen. Of course, it didn't happen. Uh, and then uh, we'll get into the structure of what you created. Um, sure. Uh, happy to talk about all of that. You know, I'd say you know, the, the firm thrived as a private partnership. It thrived as a public company. It thrived... Uh, uh, when it was owned by Lehman Brothers, Lehman Brothers, for all of the bad press, uh, uh, was uh, was was actually a good home and uh, uh, for uh, for the for the business um, for reasons I'm happy to talk about later. I think private partnership is uh, is an ideal structure for a firm for a firm like ours. Um, in, in terms of the 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 08 experience. Um, yeah, it was traumatic. Um, uh, so you know, uh, for a for a business where your your assets or your 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 people and your clients, I um, mean, your clients can leave you in a moment's notice, and your people can leave you. Um, uh, being you know, you, you stability is really important, and that environment was anything but stable, and it was anything but stable for a long period of time. Really, starting back in August of '07 through the the Bear Stearns crisis, we were in the press every day. Lehman Brothers looking to to sell um, uh, Newberger Berman to, to 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 raise capital, um, and you know, frankly, it continued all the way through um, until we finally closed the transaction in uh, in May of uh, May of 2009. So, you know, it was far from certain that this would be the, that this would be the outcome. Um, at moments, it looked like uh, the firm would cease to exist. At other moments, it looked like we were, were had been acquired by Barclays. Um, then as, as you pointed out, Spencer, we had been acquired by Bain and, and, and Hellman and Freeman. Um, in the US bankruptcy court, uh, the way it works is after they reach an agreement, um, that then goes uh, essentially is re-auctioned to make sure that the creditors got the, the highest possible price. Um, so in that re-auction process, we submitted a bid um, together with Bain and Hellman and Freeman as the, uh, uh, you know, that's the so-called stalking horse bid. Carlisle submitted a bid. Mellon showed up. Everybody sort of showed up. Um, and to my, uh, to my great surprise, um, our bid, which involved zero cash, <laughs> uh, to the estate, but a, a commitment to the creditors that uh, we would work really hard to keep this thing together. And if so, they would earn materially more over time uh, through a, a large preferred with an escalating payment and owning 49.9% of the equity, that that combination would yield a greater return to them uh, over an intermediate period than taking cash today from, from one of those private equity firms. Um, I, uh, I, everything I knew about bankruptcy at the time suggested, uh, you know, a hamburger today beats two hamburgers tomorrow. Uh, but uh, creditors who are, who are, 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 
you know, to our surprise a little bit and, and, and delight, um, ultimately said, no, we, uh, we're, we're, we're going to back the team. Um, and so they, they let us spin off and, you know, it ultimately ended up being a, a terrific transaction for them, uh, as we refinanced out the preferred with, uh, originally high yield bonds and, and later, um, high grade paper and, and repurchased all of their equity, uh, over the course of a, of a handful of years. So, you know, that's the short version of the story. Um, happy to, 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 to talk about it, but it was, uh, yeah, it was a crazy period. They just uh, well, really yeah. still still have flashbacks uh, uh, from uh, uh, from it. You don't have many gray hairs, I'll say that. So that's pretty that's impressive. Right. I, I so so get, got getting a COVID to haircut. So I don't have many right. hairs well, at all. Well, getting to our our uh, the topic at hand uh, related to culture. Uh, talk about how you're structured. I, I think uh, everybody's going to be interested in this, and and, and, and family businesses in particular, uh, because you have you, you're thinking long term. And how does your the 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 structure of the ownership um, and that approach lead to the long term? And 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 what um, sort of analogs were you thinking of when you set this up? Because I, I don't know if this was done in twenty minutes or over four months or if it changed over time. But but take us through the the structure so people know what uh, a hundred percent employee owned firm that wants to last forever looks like. There are different structures, and our structure is slightly different than you know than 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 Capital or Wellingtons. And later, um, I know Dave from NISA will be speaking. His is his is probably slightly different. I don't know exactly what his is. The the, the way you know the way ours functions is we're owned uh, by about 550 of the employees. Um, employees uh, you know above a certain income level. Are, are given the, the right to become shareholders in the firm. Um, for us, it is totally voluntary. Uh, while we were at Lehman in the final years, I think in the last year, 80% of my compensation, for example, was in Lehman Brothers stock, uh, which, uh, which did not end well. Uh, uh, and so folks, um, you know, our, our folks lost a, a tremendous amount of, of, of wealth during that period. And so the notion of doing anything that was mandatory, other than forcing them to invest side by side with clients, which we all agreed was, was critical. Um, but it, as relates to the firm, it was important. Uh, it was important to us, particularly at that moment in time, that it be voluntary. Uh, so we have somebody come in each year, they, they value the firm, they apply a material discount to that value. Um, folks who are are, will, are welcome to sell 10% of their units each year, uh, and or to buy units, and then we'll 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 lend a significant amount of those purchase proceeds um, to our younger folks, uh, such that they can can accumulate a uh, um, a share stake that is uh, that's meaningful and important to them. Uh, it's super broadly diversified. Um, we don't have any, you know. Any owner that's approaching 10%, which is the, the, the reporting materiality threshold. Frankly, we have very few who were north of one, two percent. We have, uh, you know, so it's broad, it's deep, it's meaningful ownership, and it differs by individual. So there are lots of places where we have co heads of businesses who earn exactly the same and are exactly the same position, but who have pretty substantially different levels of ownership. Some who who want to want to diversify, given uh, give it all we've been through, um, uh, or invest more side by side with clients and others uh, who, uh, who who are eager to invest more in the firm. But we we make it absolutely clear it's not a loyalty test. Um, if they uh, you know if 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 folks need to be good stewards for themselves and their families, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll we'll try and deliver an attractive return to them. And it's you know it's worked out. Uh, Better than uh, better than the most optimistic amongst us would have uh, would have expected. So I, I mean I think this discipline of um, of buying in and I assume the same discipline selling when you when you're and maybe talk about retirement how that works and sure. when people have to give up their shares but um, this idea of below you have a valuation and it's heavily discounted um, I mean that that's very important because if it were not that way. Uh, there would be obviously stress. The more successful you are, the more stress you'd have in terms of how this works, and that would force you into uh, 
to other 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 areas and other other types of ownership eventually if, if you didn't control is that is that yep. and other firms do that is that sort of how how it's done in 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 employee owned firms it it it, it that it runs the gamut. So I, I uh, grew up, as you mentioned, at Goldman Sachs and, and had the privilege of working on the should we go public or, or not go public study there. Um, and they were a, a in it book, out it book firm. Um, mm -hmm. And that creates um, precisely the, the challenge, um, Spencer, that you articulated, which is uh, when book value is a lousy proxy for your value, if you're close to retirement, um, you're you're facing a you're facing a tough choice. Um, you know, do I want to give it to the young guys beneath me, uh, or or you know take the take the cash and leave? Uh, um, uh, you know, other firms. There there's one I'm thinking of that's a, a, a significant important employee owned firm like ours. They remain an in it book and out it book firm, um, but they've given one human being the largest owner of the vote. So they've been able to stay private because that person has determined uh, that they're going to stay private. Um, in our case, um, you know, so we, it was important to me that we not be an in a book, out at book firm. At the same time, as you point out, uh, you know, it, 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 if it trades at exactly the same value as if the firm were public, then the, the, the case for investing in it is particularly if you're going to do it in a non-compulsory way as we do is, is just less, uh, is less compelling. So what we tried to do was to have it be close enough uh, to, to public value that there would be no pressure uh, uh, facing the firm to go public. Um, uh, and, you know, but, but at a discount that's substantial enough uh, to encourage, uh, to encourage employees uh, to invest. That's great. Talk, talk a little bit about the retirement rules there. You, I think that's kind of interesting. And, and I, again, a difference with family owned businesses that uh, there is a discipline of getting the shares back so they can go to the, to the younger people that are building the firm for the future rather than staying out there. Maybe just talk about sure. that briefly. So our, our rule, and again, there's no magic to it. This is just what we designed and it is something we did quickly, but it's something that, that I given what I've done at Goldman and, and, they have some amazing colleagues who did some great work and spent a lot of time with firms we admire talking about their structure. So we were, were we put it together quickly and we got lucky that the, the structure we have, we really like. Uh, so our rule is essentially um, uh, the first, uh, you, you, you can leave, you can sell as soon as a third, a third, a third, year one, year two, year three, after you leave. And importantly, I didn't, it couldn't be based on the value in the year you leave. It has to be based on subsequent years. Oh, um, that, now that's yeah. interesting. So there, while, can't, there can't be, right, right. Cherry picking. Been, you know, there was a, there was a, a famous period in the, in the 90s as, uh, as rates were popping, uh, where important, very, very important employees uh, left, quote, retired, so that they could lock in what they thought was a, a high price, right? Because there was book. Um, and so I didn't want there ever to, I didn't want people to be able to say, yikes, if I get out now, I'll get a better deal than if I stick around. That's a, that's a disaster. So we said, okay, it's based, it's, it's a third and it's in the year, the subsequent year, 18 months from now or, or, or 16 months from now or whenever, uh, which is long enough in our business that it's, uh, it's tough to have a view. It's forever. Um, or, uh, or as long as a third, a third, a third, year eight, year nine, year 10, after, after you leave. Again, totally up to employees. And we find folks of, of all stripes, you know, give me the money now to versus, uh, versus I want to stay in as long as I possibly can, subject to um, not more than 10% of the firm being owned by any retiree. Um, because I think once you start to be taking a significant amount of the profitability of the firm and giving it to folks who are who are not productive or not are not coming into the office every day and 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 building the place, um, you you lose you lose a significant amount of the alignment. So today, um, I think it's just under five percent of our equity is owned by by folks who've retired, uh, which is terrific. They built the place. It's important that they participate. Um, but 95% is, uh, is owned by folks who are, who are uh, going up and down in the elevators um, each day or zooming in uh, each day. Well, again, a, an important um, uh, lesson for family businesses in terms of how long people that are not working the business stay as owners. I think that that's incredible. 
Um, I'm sort of intrigued about governance. Um, you, you did mention the other firm where there was a person that had the, the ultimate control. So I guess that's the dictator model. So yep. you have dictator model to pure democracy, monarchy somewhere in the middle. What, what are you? Are you called the monarch, the dictator, or, or, nothing, or, nothing, or yeah. just the uh, CEO for the time being? How does it work? I'm, uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not a dictator or a monarch. I, you know, our, for, our firm was set up, um, frankly, given the seas that it was in, uh, which were incredibly choppy um, uh, with sort of strong form governance. So if you were to read the organizational documents, um, I have a, a, um, a degree of control that overstates uh, radically how in fact the place functions. So um, I, you know, I'm, I'm super eager to, to have other voices um, as much as possible. So we have a, we have an operating committee of our most senior executives we have a partnership committee of um, our most significant owners, employee owners, um, which again is you know is a, is a there's some overlap, but it's a but it is a it's a different group, uh, more skewed to our most senior investors. Um, and then we have uh, we have a board of directors, uh, which is a little unusual in an employee-owned firm, uh, but again, so the the Lehman experience for me was a was a searing one um, for good and for bad, and and there was a lot again that Lehman did right, um, but the Lehman board I think was was not necessarily the strongest the strongest board, and and Dick was mm -hmm. blindsided, and so you know we that's why I so value why we so value having a culture where. Uh, we fight with each other, uh, and and they're willing to challenge each other. That's that's critical, because um, I uh, you know far better to fight internally than to than to be surprised. Uh, one, and two, why when we went out and, and built a board, I wanted not only the strongest board, and Lehman had some extraordinary people on their board, but I wanted people who really, really, really knew the business. And so originally we set a standard that everyone who was on the board had to have been both um, a chief executive officer of a of a, a, a similar firm and a chief investment officer um, at that firm. We've started to, to loosen that a little bit to, to get uh, more diverse voices. But when we went out to do it, we, we got guys like Rich Worley who, who built Miller Anderson, one of the, the great money management sure. firms. It's now Morgan Stanley Investment <laughs> Management, uh, which, he, which he also led. Um, we have Steve Kandarian, who was the CIO and then CEO of MetLife, uh, folks like that, that, uh, you know, frankly, um, um, knew my job in many respects better than I did as a as a young CEO uh, twelve years ago. Uh, that you know, surrounding surrounding yourself with the toughest, smartest team was uh, was was essential. That, that's that's another great learning moment for for family businesses. Um, so our topic is uh, we've been through firm organization, and so a, a question I have for you is, if you had to describe the culture at Newberger. Uh, what, what what would that be in sort of a soundbite form, and and how does that differ? I'm thinking of you've been at at two iconic firms uh, with different obviously outcomes, Goldman and Lehman, but also you're in an industry with some just um, remarkably well-run firms. You've mentioned Capital Group. There's Wellington. There's T. Rowe Price. There's Fidelity. There's Schwab. There's Blackstone. BlackRock. And, and can you? Can you differentiate what you've, I mean, it seems based on your slides that it, it, it seems obvious to me that there's, there are differentiators there, but what would you say about A, your culture and B, how it's different from the, 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 the firms you were with and then also the industry you're in? Um, it's a good question. You know, our, 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 our culture is different. I think we all use a lot of the same words, but they have, they have sort of very different, um, different meanings. You know, Gold, Goldman, for example, is a culture also really um, values excellence and, and teamwork um, uh, as, as we do. I'd say if you were to compare us and Goldman, the principal difference uh, is, is, you know, in our, our case, um, uh, you know, we, we have folks who are going to spend the rest of their career. Uh, at Newberger Berman, so I, I've been there 14 years, and I'm still one of the I'm one of the youngsters uh, uh, at the place. As you, there's virtually no turnover, 
Whereas, you know, at Goldman, I was a, I was a senior guy when my age started with a two. Um, and so I, I don't think while I was at Goldman, I ever worked with anyone whose age started with a five. It was, uh, you know, their, their turnover of professionals in what's a bit of an up or out system, not explicitly, but implicitly, um, is just, is just very, is just very, very different. Um, uh, some, uh, it was funny. I was meeting with a guy who runs capital. And he said, oh my gosh, you, you, you're running uh, the, the, the firm, you, you spent your career at one firm and you're running another firm that was used at HBS in a case study as the two most polar opposite firms. And I said, I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. They're, they seem pretty similar to me. And he said, no, 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 no. They're tough. One is continuous and one is discontinuous. So it, at Goldman, uh, you know, you do what your boss says, you follow the rules, uh, you, you work really hard, you become senior, you love your boss until the moment they quit. And then they were sort of a jerk uh, and not that good. Uh, uh, whereas at Newberger Berman, uh, you probably have had a couple of other jobs before. You probably worked at a big firm, you know, maybe you taught chemistry for a while or something you've done and your, your, your principal loyalty is to your clients and your family. Uh, you put up with your boss, who's kind of a jerk, uh, until uh, until the person leaves. In which case, they were the greatest person there uh, there ever was. So, you know, in my mind, the firms are 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 similar. But uh, if you if you look at things like tenure and turnover, um, um, they're quite different. And so we put in, you know, when we were talking about that value statement, we 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 put in, for example, that comment about being non hierarchical. We don't want folks who are who are coming in saying. You know, when I worked at Goldman, I, I think I had 13 different jobs. I was I was laser focused on how to get to the next step and, and what's the better place to be in and the like. For us, um, we tend to hire people who who just love who want to be great private equity investors or great hedge fund investors who are, are, are really cover clients and who are focused on um, who are passionate about about that thing and have done enough work in their life to know that's really what they want to do. As opposed to as opposed to necessarily um, being more senior, I think you know half of the X number of thousand folks that Goldman recruit, you know, probably in the back of their mind think you know if they play their cards right, they can run the firm, um, and and that's a good thing, you know, given the the great folks they hire out of Olin and and other places, you know, at Newberger Berman, nobody wants my job. Uh, uh, <laughs> everybody, uh, everybody, you know, they're they're far better jobs, which are are managing money, doing battle with the markets, um, uh, taking care of important clients. Those are uh, uh, my, my, my job is the, the, the short stick. That's interesting. Um, I, I was just thinking as you recounted all that, it would make a great Saturday Night Live skit, but we won't, <laughs> we won't get, get into that different role play. Sir. Um, an intriguing question about an employee-owned firm is, is the issue of risk aversion um, and how, um, uh, how how open to new ideas. I, I mean, I love your the, the idea. You have a board that's it sounds completely independent with with great minds on it. But how do you um, overcome the what I would think would be a natural tendency? And of course, family businesses have this in spades of of being too inwardly focused, satisfied with what you've got. Um, you know, you've got all these people who are successful in their in their unit. How do you get them to think broadly about what's next and what should the firm be doing? I mean, and looking at your slides, wow, you have been anything but standing still uh, with new um, types of investments, uh, strategies, market segments, and globally. So I just talk about how you how you get a culture of innovation in the context of a of a, a it's not a closed system, but an employee owned system. Um. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great question. Um, I would say a, a couple of things. The, the 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 biggest difference I would say in terms of appetite for risk um, is, in my mind, you know, more orientation in short term versus long term. So, our is is we think about risk. Um, I, I can't sell any of my units. I can sell ten percent, you know, next year in theory, but but I'm not gonna. Uh, uh, so for me, my orientation as an owner is very long and, and frankly is consistent with my career horizon, uh, uh, how long I plan to how long I plan to stay at the firm, which in our case, the, given the turnover statistics is tends to be very, very long. So 
we have a you know we are far less sensitive to uh, from a from a risk perspective uh, to to short term losses. Um, far less focused on you know what's next quarter's EBITDA going to be. You know, frankly, I, I I can't remember the last time somebody asked me what next quarter's EBITDA is going to be. It's just you know it's they want to my my owners care a thousand times more. Uh, somebody pitched me yesterday on you know can help you come in and. We're going to help you optimize your real estate footprint in uh, in in po post pandemic, and we're gonna we're gonna find a bunch of savings. And I tried to explain to the individual, all of my all of my owners work here, and and they if I tell them good news and bad news. The you know the good news is uh, we I saved the firm fifty million bucks. The bad news is you're going from a a, a nice pleasant place to work to you're sitting on a bench. <laughs> uh, with uh, a bunch of other folks, I'll get I'll get thrown out of the place, and so uh, it's a it's a it's a completely different optimization function uh, than uh, than the way that that we as shareholders torture public company um, owners to, uh, to to deliver us uh, deliver us free cash flow. So I'd say that's you know that's a difference. One, two. I believe from a risk perspective. Um, in our case, I, I, I believe, you know, we, our business doesn't require a lot of capital. And I, I believe strongly that businesses like us are best uh, when they have less capital and that it's all aligned with clients. I don't want to go down a path of, and then some of our big competitors have, where we have a ton of capital um, because that leads you to places which I think are, are unfortunate in a fiduciary business of, Ooh, this is an interesting unit. Should we do this for clients or for ourselves? I don't ever want. I don't ever want to face that. I don't ever want to face that question and that that tough trade-off. We want to do one thing, uh, which is to, uh, um, to 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 partner with clients. So we don't have the sort of balance sheet risk um, that uh, that others um, that others that others do by virtue of uh, the way in which we manage it, which is it's all it's all. You know, as much as we can have it be side by side, um, side by side with clients um, uh, invested uh, in, in, in invested for the long term, and we've tried really hard to bring sort of best practices from um, from leading places that uh, you know have great big balance sheets and levered balance sheets and all the like. So our uh, I brought in as uh, head of risk a guy named Ken Durrett. Ken was the youngest partner ever at Morgan Stanley ran fixed income uh, uh, there, then ran risk for them during the financial crisis uh, and thereafter and did an extraordinary job keeping them alive, then ran fixed income again, um, brought him in to, 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 to run risk. Um, uh, he then went on to, to be one of the leaders of our fixed income business. And we, we brought in a woman named Ann Brennan who had been, I think a 24 year partner at Goldman. She had run, um, uh, big chunks of their fixed income franchise, including credit research, and uh, is, is just terrific. So, you know, the we think a lot about it. We staff it seriously, um, but it, it's not. Uh, uh, it, it's a totally different objective function than when you were running a running a, a forty to one levered financial institution. We have, you know. We have, uh, uh, you know, a tiny amount of debt, as you saw on the slide, 1.2 1, 1. times um, uh, our, our current EBITDA. So uh, are, are very conservatively uh, levered, really just to facilitate our employee ownership. So really, it's interesting. You, you, you do go into new things. And I want you to talk about this dial transaction because it, it, just reading about it, uh, I remember when uh, Dial and a few other firms were, were creating the, the market in general partnership interests in private equity firms, but I had no idea it was this successful. So I'd love to have you talk about that. And, and, I, and we do have a bunch of questions, so we want to get to those. But, but that's an interesting example of getting into a new area that, I mean, really, who would have thought that that thing would have grown like that? And then it's so successful that the right answer appears to be doing what you're doing, which is let it let it uh, fly away. Although you're going to retain an ownership, uh, but you're you're doing it innovatively. You you're you're in the SPAC. You're a beneficiary of the SPACdom here, 
Uh, but among the questions we've been getting while you're talking is, uh, what do you think about SPACs? What do you think about Bitcoin? What do you think about Robinhood? I mean, there's there's so many things going on uh, that relate to innovation, call it, uh, and uh, enlighten us on how you how you sort of separate the good ones from the bad ones and what you're going to focus on. But Dow would be a good one to, to just, if you can do it briefly, tell us about that. It's a pretty neat story. Yeah. So, um, you know, Dial started a little bit by accident um, uh, when a, a, a team of um, high net worth brokers at Lehman Brothers uh, wanted to set up a hedge fund and Lehman didn't want them to run a hedge fund. And so uh, Lehman formed an agreement with them where they could leave, but Lehman would retain a 20% ownership stake in the business. Um, and the, those group of individuals uh, formed what uh, what we all knew as GLG, which is one of the you know it was one of the most successful hedge funds um, in Europe, and the first to go public. Um, and so uh, uh, the folks at Lehman before I arrived included, wow, this this owning pieces of firms is uh, <laughs> when it works, it works pretty well. We should do more of that. Uh, and so. Uh, we bought pieces of a firm called Spinnaker, a, a, um, a firm called Osprey, which uh, in the commodity space, which ended up not making it, a firm called Marble Bar that was then sold, um, and then uh, uh, D.E. Shaw. Um, after, uh, uh, in my former colleagues, the guy who actually took my seat at Goldman, uh, saw what we were doing and said, that's smart, we should do it with client money, though not firm capital, which I think is the better way, the, the better way to do it. Um, and so they started a competing unit called Peters Hill, uh, which is uh, we, continues to exist and 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 prosper. Uh, when Lehman failed, we we said, hey, we're pretty good at doing this. Why don't we Why don't we try and do it with some clients? Um, and you know, we had very modest expectations, and frankly, first focused on the hedge fund space, which has obviously been very difficult. Uh, and then uh, and then moved into uh, into the private equity uh, into the private equity space, and um, have. Uh, you know, by by having a, a terrific team on the ground, um, have been able to build a you know a, a real leadership position there. So it's uh, it's been quite extraordinary. We own um, uh, our clients own uh, pieces of fifty two uh, hedge funds and private equity firms, many of the the, the largest in the world, the the Silver Lakes and the Vistas and and others. Um, and it's been a you know it's been a um, it, it's been a remarkable uh, a, a remarkable story. So. More successful than we would envision, since we're um, uh, since this is uh, the, this discussion is being funded by the the, the Koch Center. Um, it's known that the the Kochs have been our our partners, um, interestingly, in helping to to build that business, um, and and have been terrific partners, frankly, in uh, enabling um, you know our small little firm. Uh, to to have a to have a, a, a meaningful amount of capital to go out and uh, and build and grow the business and uh, have been just uh, ter terrific honorable folks to to to, to work with. Who got That's interesting. Now, just just for the record, those are different cokes than our cokes here. Although our cokes are pretty remarkable as well, but they're 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 the St. Louis cokes as opposed to the. Uh, the Kansas Cubs, but at any rate, the, the concept We'd be eager is to though, partner with them as well. So. <laughs> oh yeah, no, <laughs> and and they would like to partner with you, I might add. Um, so, uh, but I think that's a great example of of risk management. The way you described it, you, you, you know, you, you didn't jump in it as a firm; it was client driven, and they like. And then as the thing gets spun out, um, uh, that that uh, obviously uh, it, it takes you a little further away from that too, as something that could be very disruptive. I mean, success can be as disruptive as failure. As we, as we all know, well, so that leads to uh, this this discussion uh, that's going on everywhere about uh, cyber currency and Bitcoin and all that. Uh, is that tempting to you, or is that something that I mean? Do you get asked about that, or is it is it any, are any of your teams going in that direction? And, and would you would you tell them no, you can't do that, or how's that work? So we're 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 we're, we're spending a huge amount of time um, thinking about it. We. Uh, um, I uh, uh, get blamed, uh, you know, for for keeping us out of uh, um, out of, of Bitcoin and cyber currency um, a few years ago, uh, when we had a, a, a team of folks who were eager to do it. I just, for for, for me, I I uh, 
the, the bar has to be pretty high for, for, for us to pursue something. And I, 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 I can't live with, you know, we're, we're a fiduciary business, not a trading business. And it felt more to me like that was better pursued by the sell side um, than, than, than by the buy side. Um, but it's changing and evolving very quickly. Um, it's, becoming, uh, it's becoming quite real. Uh, you know, the, the regulatory environment is going to be really interesting and is going to be, uh, and is going to be determinative. And it's, it's something that I've probably spent, um, I don't know, uh, an hour a day on, you know, each day over the course of the past couple of weeks is we're, we're learning more and understanding and trying to, to figure out if there's, if there's something there for us to do thoughtfully and, and, and responsibly. That's great. Well, I, I mean, I, yeah, we'll, we'll to be continued on that. And we'll look forward to uh, learning about what, what you ultimately decide to do. A, a, a shift here uh, for you uh, in the discussion to talk about your, I think you call it diversity, equity, inclusion. Talk about what you're doing there. And that I assume that's mostly within the firm. And then I'm intrigued by your partnership of New York role uh, bring us up to date on um, the future of your great city up there and and, uh, <laughs> and what you're doing about that, because that obviously is in the news a lot. But first on, on the DEI front, uh, how successful have you been with that initiative? Um, you know, not as successful as we'd like to tell you the truth. So we, we um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a firm value. It's incredibly important to us. It's incredibly important to our clients. Um, we have... Um, in all things, we try hard, really hard to be honest with ourselves. And, and so, uh, as you see, when, when I measure our firm's performance, how we're doing on diversity, equity, and inclusion is right up there with firm profitability. Um, and we, we, in a narrow sense, uh, we, we measure it uh, two ways. Uh, we measure it by um, individuals in roles, and do we look like the population uh, from uh, from which we recruit? Uh, and there, while we're we're you know we score materially higher than most of our peers, and have, have you know won a bunch of awards, we're still nowhere near where we where we need to be, um, and we need to do a better job of uh, uh, um, uh, particularly at the senior investor level of uh, of 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 finding and building um, uh, individuals of, of color and uh, and uh, terrific uh, terrific uh, uh, women, um, the firm interestingly has a has a long culture of doing that. So if you were uh, back when I joined, um, the largest uh, PM uh, in in uh, at the firm uh, happened to be African American, uh, guy named Andy Johnson, who who uh, ran our uh, high grade business. Um, and the uh, largest uh, equity portfolio manager happened to be the co-head of our, our largest single fund, who, uh, a woman. So we, we have a culture of, of doing that historically, but interestingly, um, despite all of the, the leadership that we had there, haven't, you know, haven't kept pace uh, the, way, the way that we should. Um, so it's an explicit goal. We measure it. We tell the world how we're doing. Uh, and we're, we're trying really hard to hold ourselves accountable. At the same time, um, I'm equally focused on inclusion um, and, and trying to be honest with our, ourselves there as well. So we were huge believers in anonymous surveys um, and in um, providing sort of real feedback. And it's something we, 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 we do regularly as a firm to figure out um, how folks are, are, are feeling at the firm. So it's helped me tremendously. We use on those surveys, um, we then break the world uh, up, um, you know, any, any, any number of ways and look at under historically underrepresented groups. And we look at their answers um, to, to key questions. Um, do I feel like I belong at the firm? Um, is the firm meritocratic? Is the firm sincere in its commitments um, uh, on, on DEI? Do I have a, a strong um, mentor uh, relationship? Things, think, things like that. It's a, a five, five key questions. And then we measure how every group is doing relative to the group who scores the highest, because our objective is to, is to bring everybody along. In most cases, the highest scores are, are old white guys. Um, uh, not always. There are a number of uh, the scores where, uh, where interestingly, we, we score better amongst our, our female employees. 
but but we need to we need to figure out um, how we're doing on all of those because we need to to um, be a, a an inclusive uh, an inclusive environment and when we attract great folks we've got to retain them uh, and so continuing right. to drive that score um, to to a hundred a hundred defined as the the happiest group whoever that is uh, is uh, is critical and is something that we're we're super focused on so both both the inclusion and the diversity and I don't think you can you can really you can't you're not going to nail one without the other. Um, right. and, and we got to do better. We got to do better on both. That's great. Talk, talk a little bit about this partnership, New York. I know you're on the executive committee of that. Is that taking up a lot of your time or is it? Um, is it... Part, so partnership for New York is sort of similar to the old civic progress in, in St. Louis. Um, it's the uh, uh, corporate, you know, corporate business leaders. Um, it is something that I, I happen to spend a lot of time on because New York's been uh, been very very good to to to, to me and my family, and am, am eager to give back. It's a you know it's a really hard period in New York. We were uh, sort of the center uh, the center of COVID, uh, and will be the 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 center is a is a high tax um, city and, and right. state um, are going to be at the the center of the storm uh, in terms of dealing uh, with with the, the post COVID. Uh, COVID recovery. So we're, we're, we're working hard, uh, you know, frankly, to be good citizens and to, to, to help New York uh, uh, recover because it's, you know, it's been tough today. If you were to go through Manhattan, you know, roughly 12% of the office space is being used. That's uh, incredible. Uh, wow. Which, you know, here we are almost a year uh, past the on, onset of this. So it's, uh, if I used, I mean, people in their offices, you know, right. not, 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 uh, yeah. Um, so we, you know, we got a, we got a, we got a long way to go um, to uh, um, to help uh, rebuild our city, and we're we're trying uh, really hard to be, you know, constructive corporate citizens and do everything we can to to help the city recover. That's great. Well, I mean, it's a challenge everywhere. So bravo to everybody that's making an effort to help others. Uh, final question for you: We sort of run out of time, sadly, but uh, since you came from St. Louis. Um, what do you miss out here? And then what can we learn? What can we learn from you up in New York? I don't, we don't want your taxes. Let's, let's start with that. But what, what else can we learn? <laughs> um, I, miss, I love, I love growing up in St. Louis. I love St. Louis. I was so eager to participate in this because it, uh, uh, it came with the prospect of, uh, of, of getting to come back, uh, which I get to do actually a bunch because St. Louis is, it might be the second most important city in America in our business, um, uh, when, wow. when you think about when you think about for us um, the presence that Wells has in St. Louis, you think about um, Edie Jones, um, you know, you 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 think about Stiefel, you think about a number of the most important consulting firms yeah. that are headquartered in St. Louis or have important offices in St. Louis. Uh, the number of terrific um, banks and, and and trust companies that that exist. It's uh, it, it really rivals uh, it, it really rivals anywhere else. So I do get to come home uh, uh, occasionally uh, to, 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 to visit uh, to visit uh, clients um, as well as uh, as well as to see friends. But you know, I'm a I'm a diehard uh, blues fan, uh, much to the frustration of uh, um, my colleagues in whatever city we happen to be playing, and a big Cardinals fan. So I'm I'm excited to uh, to, to zoom in for your next session. Oh, with, you're uh, with the owners of those franchises, which sound uh, far more interesting than the investment management <laughs> universe. No, you've been you've been a star today, and I, I think for the family business out there that are listening to this, I think there are a lot of um, lessons that can be picked up from this this extremely impressive uh, employee owned firm. So, George, uh, with that, I, I just want to thank you for your consideration and your time and your your insights. Uh, it's been uh, it's been thrilling for us. And uh, we'll be following your remarkable career as it, it moves forward. I hope there's not another move in there. I, I, and I'm sure you're not looking for that either. But whatever you do, we're, we're proud of you from our city. But thank you for participating today. And I'll turn the program back to Bart Hamilton to wrap up. Thank you. Appreciate thank it, you, George. Spencer. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you, uh, both Spencer and George. Really fascinating and enlightening uh, conversation. I, I really liked one of the things that, that George said about key value of Newberger Berman is aligning firm, employee, and client 
And I think that's something for family businesses, aligning firm, employee, client, and family is something that's a real challenge. And it sounds like to do some of that, and we kind of got a feel for that on the discussion of DEI in terms of embracing challenging dialogue. And I think that's something that it sounds like that's a piece that's made Newberger Berman very successful. Uh, and also something that's hard for family business to do, but very important for their success as well. So thank you, George, uh, for joining us. Um, I'm now going to turn the turn things over to Peter Baumgarten, the Koch uh, Professor of Practice and Family Enterprise, who's going to be moderating a panel discussion with uh, David Eichhorn and uh, Michael Deerberg to reflect on a lot of the insights that um, George uh, brought us in the first hour today. Peter, the floor is yours. Great. The virtual floor is mine. Always great to be with you all here today. Again, George, great to have you on the call earlier on today and really excited about our second uh, set of panelists here. I think one of the things that we're attempting to do over the course of this symposium is to tie some themes from our keynote speaker into the experience of the people that are living in our particular markets. So we have two great voices to be able to join us along the way here for that conversation. And again, just as a reminder, next week, we're going to be uh, hopping into the world of sports. So looking forward to seeing you all there as well. So let me make a, a quick introduction to our two panelists here today. We are joined by Mike Deerberg first. Uh, Mike is the chairman of the parent company of First Bank, a bank headquartered in St. Louis that serves markets in Missouri, Illinois, Kansas, Nebraska, and California, and has been family owned for 111 years, 1910 for the start of that. Prior to joining First Bank in 2010, Deerberg served as the attorney for the US uh, Department of Justice and as a general counsel of First Bank. So great to have you here, Mike. Thank you. We, we are also joined by David Eichhorn. So David is the chief executive officer and chair of NISA's investment committee and a member of NISA's management committee. He has day-to-day -day oversight over NISA's investment strategies group, which seeks to develop custom strategies designed to meet client objectives. In this capacity, he oversees new product development and growth. He has written papers on fixed income and asset allocation and presented it in a variety of different locations. He spent a few years at JP Morgan beforehand. And maybe most importantly for our conversation, he has a BSBA from our very own Washington University in St. Louis with majors in finance and mathematics. Great to have you here, Dave. I am delighted to be here. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna start off by going a little rapid fire at the front end. I'm gonna go same question to you both. I think this will be helpful for us to understand a little bit about your particular organizations. So uh, rapid fire question to you is to say, how would you describe your organization in a sentence or two? Um, it might be easier to understand if you've got a brick and mortar presence like we see with First Bank, but how would you describe its ownership and what makes it unique in terms of structure and culture? So let's start out with Mike first, and then we'll go over to Dave. Sure. Well, thanks. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, so, you know, First Bank is a traditional, you know, in many ways, a traditional bank. I guess what sets us apart is that we are a family-owned business that caters uh, to family-owned businesses as sort of the core of our sweet spot. So privately held businesses, but really a focus within that on, on family-owned businesses. Um, and I think as far as, uh, you know, uh, from a cultural standpoint, uh, one thing that sets us apart is long-term perspective. So I, I don't think that there are that many companies that have the kind of forever or, you know, they're looking out so far into the future, whether it's forever, as my dad would put it, or I might put it in the next hundred years uh, time frame. but that is very much embedded to uh, who we are as a company. Great. And real quick, Mike, just to follow up on that point, do you find that the family ownership piece uh, helps you bring unique insights or perspective to the family owned clients that you serve? Is that some of the value proposition that you add? We understand you, we've been there, we know what that looks like to run your type of business. Exactly. So I think, you know, my, by my own personal experience growing up in a family owned business is that there hasn't been a lot of uh, resources out there to help family owned businesses. So we're all kind of left to our own devices to figure out how this is supposed to go. So, uh, you know, it's great that, you know, the Koch, through the Koch family, uh, that the center was started. So I think this is really a credit to WashU, to the Koch family for having started this. And so I think in St. Louis, you're finding some energy around uh, the topic of family owned businesses, but historically there hasn't been that much. And so we are taking some of our own experiences, the experiences of our own clients 
and really using those to get really beyond banking to help our clients with many of these issues. Okay, great. So uh, Dave, same question over to you on this. Um, many of us have seen First Bank in various different signs around time, but we don't see NISA as frequently. Could you give us a sense on who NISA is, what your structure and culture is like, maybe even comparison to some of the stuff that you just heard from George? Great. Yeah, by, by not seeing us frequently, that probably means never. Uh, and so I'll try to give a little background. But first, I do want to say I really enjoyed uh, George's uh, walkthrough of, of the firm and their history. Um, I've seen the same industry as, as Newberger. Uh, that was just, just a treat. Um, so that was fabulous. But um, NISA is also an asset manager. We serve strictly in an institutional market um, and strictly in a fiduciary capacity, as, as exactly what George walked through. Um, we manage about 400 billion in assets currently. Um, they're a bit simpler assets uh, um, than, than everything George runs. So you can read IE lower fees. So we're not as big as, as they are certainly, um, but still a sizable, uh, certainly a sizable market value that we manage on behalf of clients. Again, entirely institutional. So we manage that for only 200, little over 200 clients. So the quick math is we tend to have large average account sizes to say the least. Um, so that's the nature of our business. They tend to be large pension funds, uh, endowments, foundations, et cetera. Um, as far as the ownership structure at a high level, it's very, very similar to what George walked through. We are 100% employee owned. Um, we have around 80 employee owners of one capacity or another out of about 350 or so employees, all based in St. Louis. Um, and, and that's our structure. Maybe later we'll get into a little more details, um, not identical to, to Georgia's structure, but at, but at a high level, very similar. Um, no outside ownership, no outside debt. Um, and then lastly, I think culturally, boy, I, I couldn't, George had so many great points that I'd, I'd agree with, or at least we aspire to. I don't know if we hit it every day, but I know we aspire to it. But I think the one thing that distinguishes us most in our industry, I'd like to think, is true um, I'd say client obsession of focusing on what they really need, not pushing products that we think make sense, but rather listening to clients, which sounds trite or made up, but truly listening to clients, customizing strategies for our clients and meeting what they actually need versus what's the topic du jour in, in our industry, which our industry has done a lot of bad things, frankly, over the years. We try to be on the good side of, of, of that. Great. And you can do the quick math uh, by dividing asset center management by number of clients and realize that I am not one of your clients. I want to ask you just one, one quick follow-up point on that. What do you get by virtue of serving, let's say, 200 clients versus 600, 1,200, 2,000? What, what do you uh, or what are you able to do by virtue of being structured in that way? I think you really get genuine intimate knowledge of your clients and what they're trying to do. We only operate in a few, uh, a few ponds that, you know, they tend to be large average clients, but, um, but, but I think what that allows is you learn, you know, our best our ideas, our product development, I would say stems directly from clients asking us to do something a little different or, or giving us a challenge. And so I think the benefit of having such a small number of clients allows us to highly customize, really know what our clients are thinking and trying to accomplish and, and hopefully trying to deliver something uh, that, that is, it meets all those needs. Great. So one of the distinct honors I have in this particular role is I get to have conversations with folks like Mike and Dave beforehand. And we had a little bit of a call in advance and a few email exchange uh, exchanges. And uh, you both made relatively provocative claims that I want to dig into a bit here. So Mike, in particular, you said that you are willing to be, and I quote, the defender of the dominant form of ownership in the world. You may not have realized that I was going to quote your email here back to you, but I, I want to hear your particular take on why you think this form of ownership, which is dominant, if you look at all firms out there, is, uh, is rightfully so. And uh, the follow-up question for you, Dave, so I'm going to give you some time to think about this once we get uh, through Mike here, is you said that you believe that if more Wall Street firms were employee-owned in the past decade or two, we would not have had the 2008 crisis. So whether or not you were both throwing this out in flippant ways, I think it's worth digging into both of these claims because I think we're going to learn quite a bit by virtue of that. So Mike, same question to you on the front end. When it comes to being the defender of the dominant form of ownership in the world, how do you think about that? What is the value add of family ownership in contrast to the various different forms of ownership options that are out there? 
Well, I think, you know, as first, as you, uh, I think, alluded to, uh, family-owned businesses are the dominant form by, by way of numbers. Uh, so uh, I think it's like 80 to 90 percent of all businesses uh, in the United States are family-owned, um, and it's like 65 percent of the of the GDP of the United States. Uh, so by numbers, we 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 win. But I, I don't think that the, my my point would not be like we're always better because I don't think that's the case. Uh, and there may be contexts where another form is better. For example, or it might work in a different context. Uh, technology startups, they don't work well as family owned businesses. The capital needs of those companies, the ability to fund uh, losses for an extended period of time, right at, right at the outset. That's not something you can do as a family owned business typically. Uh, professional firms, uh, just as an example, uh, so that, that tends to probably gravitate more towards the employee ownership partnership model. Uh, you don't see a whole lot of law firms named Jones, Jones, and Jones. Right. If, if there is that law firm, then it's probably that's th those are the lawyers in that firm. Um, so on, on the family business side, I think, you know, what, one thing that it's sort of you've got to go back to how, how these businesses get started. And a lot of it is the that's really the that's the outgrowth of the entrepreneurial spirit in America and elsewhere where somebody uh, has this idea and they, they run with that idea. They take all kinds of incredible risks to make it happen. And they invest themselves, their lives, their, their families in those businesses. And maybe eventually they have this idea of, well, maybe I want to pass that on uh, to my next, to the next generation within the family. Maybe they decide to do something else. Um, Family-owned businesses, we have our own challenges and our own uh, opportunities slash advantages. Uh, and I think like anything else, it's a matter of you need to make the most of your advantages and minimize your, 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 your weaknesses or the challenges you have. But it's not, I think for, you know, for Dave and I, it's not so much like uh, employee owned versus, versus um, uh, family owned. Cause I think there's more as I think Spencer started out calling it close cousins there. We have a lot more in common, I think, uh, than we have that separate us in particular in relation to uh, publicly owned firms uh, and how, you know, I think both employee owned firms and uh, family owned firms have this long-term perspective. Yeah, it was a nice description, though, in the sense that there might be different uh, junctures of how do you describe your industry and your sector and your business that might migrate you towards one versus another. And to know a little bit about the needs of your business might make you say family owned doesn't actually work well for us in this particular moment. I, I want to just um, build upon one point here before we shift back over to Dave. Um, and in particular, this this transition point. So you're running a family owned business and you wanna pass something on to the next generation. What do you think guides someone to say, I wanna pass on the business versus the assets that are made by virtue of selling the business, selling to a, a new buyer and pass that on? What do you think is the, the juncture there that guides passing the actual business entity itself onto the next generation? I think for the founder, the, the uh, guy or woman who started the business, I think it's really a question about what is that next generation? Are they interested in it? Uh, how do they how do they value the business? Um, so, for example, if they view it as something that it's beyond, it's not so much a question about financial return. It's about the value that the business can bring, uh, either bring to the community, bring to the family, bring to the employees. That maybe there's a value to independence uh, and to maintaining the family hands that goes beyond whether this is the best possible return. Because one thing I think you know. Uh, you could, if you attend WashU uh, Business School, um, you would know that you know diversification as an investor, from as an investor standpoint, uh, there's a lot to be said for diversification. And if a family, including your children, have all their eggs in the family in that basket, that that's not necessarily in keeping with that principle of diversification. So the question is, are there benefits beyond that? And there are so many family businesses that say that there is that benefit. Now, a lot of them don't make it to pass it on the next generation. And the odds are actually against passing it to the next generation. Uh, but a lot of that has to do with not necessarily intent. It's maybe that the children, maybe the children don't have the intent or desire. Maybe they don't have the capacity. Maybe it's not something for them. Uh, and of course, then just the normal things of is the business continuing to be successful such that it, it can be passed on. Right. And we're actually going to come back to that a bit later on uh, because uh, we were talking a bit beforehand about the difference between G1 and G2, generation one, generation two. But ironically, it wasn't you, Mike, that brought it up in our conversation. It was Dave as a member of G2 of NISA. 
But Dave, I, I can't let you get off on the tough question that I have volleyed for you next. And it's this question around averting the 2008 financial crisis and whether employee ownership might have made a difference there. Dig into that a bit more. What, what's your reasoning behind the fact that you think this would have shifted the incentives, shifted the structure, shifted the outcomes for the financial service sector? Well, Peter, nothing but like being held accountable to things you put in an email, right? I didn't think that <laughs> I didn't think that would actually happen. But no, I'll stick by that, or, or at least at a minimum, it would have been a, in my opinion, a, a lot less grave of a situation. And, and I think it's it's largely self evident. I don't I don't think, um, I mean, the, the Wall Street structure historically, going back decades, was more of a partnership structure um, in one fashion or another. Maybe not family held, but at least partnership. I just don't think owner operators. Uh, lever 20 to one, their, their, their capital. I, I think that's wildly imprudent maybe in any, in any circumstance, but I just don't think you do that when you have so many of your own chips uh, on the table. And I think that's a big difference. And I think, I think it's just a class, classic principal agent issue that, that was laid bare. And, and this is not to say all public companies therefore are going to fall into this. So all companies are going to lever up. All public companies are going to do something disastrous. This is not a screed against public companies, far from it. Um, but I do think particularly financial companies that are systematically important um, and ones, and also I'll juxtapose the business that, that George and I are in is asset management. As we point out, our, we're not a capital-based firm. It's other people's money. But when you talk about the investment banking firms like the Lehman's and Goldman's, obviously they have both, but their investment banking side, um, not, not only is it uh, like typical public companies that they need to borrow money and at some level, the capital markets are a governor on how much most companies can lever. But when you're in a financial firm, there's so many shadow forms of leverage. And that's really what we saw a lot of those organizations do. And I think it was short termism and frankly, the willingness of something bad happens they can move down the road and get a different job at a different firm. Obviously, it was particularly bad for, for the entire industry. So I've, in that context, I think the lack of alignment of interest of the folks who are taking all the risks, ultimately, whether it be with society or, or the ultimate shareholders, I think was, a, was just clearly laid bare in the crisis. And I think everything that Dodd, or not everything, many of the things that Dodd-Frank has attempted to do to correct that, um, or, or things that are naturally addressed by an employee-owned firm. You know, comments like, you know, having the, the key owners get deferred payouts, right? Well, George walked through, they're definitionally deferred when you're in an employee-owned firm. So Dodd-Frank is kind of running around its backhand of forcing public companies in certain ways to try to act like employee-held. Had they been employee-held, I think we have at least a less severe outcome from the 2008 uh, crisis, to be sure. I think what I have guaranteed myself of is the fact that every future uh, guest on this particular podcast or symposium is going to send me really short emails and not be held accountable for any phrase that they have in there. So um, exactly. I want to just, I want to do a, a quick contrast here. So employee ownership is a, a new concept for many of the people that are on here, um, or not new, but at least something that we may not have uh, further insight into. You had George describe their structure of employee ownership. I wonder if you can speak to how NISA's is similar, how it's distinct, and how you think that changes uh, the structure of how you actually behave. Well, it, it's definitely similar in, in the sense 100% held by employees. Um, and, and so it versus other structures at a, at a 20,000 foot level, I'd say you could call it the same. I think the details, um, it was great to hear them because because there's a lot of there's a few things I learned from uh, George there that, that maybe we should bake into our structure. But um, one key element is how folks uh, both obtain ownership and also how, how it gets returned back to the organization. So we don't have employees buy in. I'll, I'll use kind of air quotes here. Employees are given equity. Um, that sounds far more generous than it really is. I think the way you can think about it, it's sweat equity over time how uh, folks have earned the right to have a stake in the company and we can ignore the details, but they're given a stake in the company at some point. And then that grows and it grows in a direct way related to our revenue, et cetera. Um, I'll juxtapose versus, versus Newberger. I'll say the, the um, we are close, we're a book, more of a book value shop. Um, I'll call it a meaningful discount to market. Um, and we probably live between that, that on, on the benevolent dictator side and the democracy in the sense of I still think we're at a point where there's a handful of folks who have complete control to where 
there can't be a revolt and say we need to go public like a Goldman Sachs maybe did in the in the mid '90s, et cetera. So, so, so that's kind of a key distinction. And then lastly, when when folks leave, they have to be redeemed. There's no way to to retain ownership as you leave because that needs to be recycled back to the next generation. Great. We're gonna have to do a little external research on that whole benevolent part of the benevolent dictatorship <laughs> brain. We'll, we'll get back to. I didn't say it was me. I didn't say it was me. <laughs> All right, so um, that, that's really helpful to see the framing. I, I wanna transition now to the, to the two of you here for this conversation around transition across generations. And you've experienced it in slightly different ways. So again, as I mentioned earlier on, we had this use of generation one and generation two. Uh, Mike, in your uh, case, we'd have to look back a few more Gs to be able to see that actually coming through if you were started as a family owned business in 1910. So, I wonder one of the things uh, that I'd like to actually hear from here is I wonder how you think about what enables the successful transition across generations and whether that is uh, going from the initial founder into to your role, Dave, outside of the family ownership structure, but into an ESOP. And Mike, for your particular experience, whether it is with your particular transition into leadership or previous generations, uh, this does not always go well. Um, we sometimes lose, as we'll talk later on, the founder's mentality, the way to be uh, relatively robust and strategic and aggressive in regards to how we approach our own business. But I'm, I'm curious what it looks like for you all to do any sort of transition across generations well. And in fact, Mike, let's start with you, because uh, you might have some good historical perspective about what it's looked like for First Bank. Sure. Well, so I think what I'd say is uh, I am technically fourth generation as you said, you know, we, the, the company has been family owned since 1910. In some ways, uh, I really function as second generation. So I can explain that. So a uh, company founded in St. Louis, actually Creve Core, uh, but it was really a sort of a mom and pop, like single branch bank up until the 1960s. By the time it got to my dad's generation, generation three, uh, or G3 as we will call it, uh, by that generation, uh, it had been dispersed amongst cousins. Uh, my dad showed uh, financial acumen uh, and had done well. He actually it was investing in the stock market at a, at, while he was in high school, uh, did really well there, used, and basically used that money then essentially to, by the time he got out of college and went to law school, he bought out uh, relatives. Uh, so essentially, he, you know, he took it sort of, uh, the, the family tree got, got, from an ownership standpoint, got smaller. Um, and, uh, and then, so from there, we had this incredible growth, uh, spree, uh, you know, lasting decades, uh, where we were doubling size every five years and, you know, grew to various other states. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I think when we think about our transition, it's, it's been sort of, you, know, you think about it from, uh, I guess from generation two to my dad, where he, he, he bought out, um, his, uh, you know, aunts, uncles, et cetera. Uh, and then to uh, transition to my generation. So my dad, he went to law school um, and I think he was, he was very early on into things about generational transition. Of, he's, he's always had a really incredibly uh, long-term outlook. Uh, and so while, you know, essentially, uh, I think before I was born, my siblings were born, he was already planning a, a transition, uh, which is really incredible. And it really, it, it served us well uh, from a ownership transition standpoint that he was doing this so early that it really helped out from the ownership transition standpoint. Um, my dad uh, retired from being the active CEO or being the CEO of the company in the early 2000s. So we've had a leadership transition. So there's the ownership transition, which again, you know, it really happened at, my, at our birth. I think this gener my generation's birth. Uh, and then there's the leadership transition where we went from my dad as CEO uh, to non-family CEO in the early 2000s. Uh, and we've had a non-family CEO uh, since then. So, I mean, we're, we were probably a little bit unique in this last transit or the last, you know, I guess from this, in this generation in terms of our transition from a leadership standpoint, that it's not a family member who's a CEO and I'm chairman of the parent company at First Bank. I'm active in the company day to day. I have a title of president of the bank, but uh, we do have non-family CEO. We have this, you know, incredible group of leaders uh, we also have had um, for a long time, and at least going back to the early 2000s, a very strong independent board. And we can talk about that later, but that definitely has helped from a transition standpoint. Uh, so again, I think we're somewhat unique uh, from that standpoint, uh, but I do think that 
having outside help, whether that's from a board uh, or any, any sort of outside help you can get as part of this transition in a family business is really important. Yeah, and that's a, it's a nice touch point towards what the research says around family business. So some of the success that uh, occurs inside family ownership does seem to require this blend of insider and outsider perspective. So when you have too much family interest and control in one side and it's not balanced by the outsider perspective, it can lead towards some of the negative effects that we see in terms of performance. But when it is balanced well, it can actually lead towards higher performance downstream. But we'll come back to that in a short bit. Uh, so Dave, to you, you are a G2, but a non-family G2. Walk us back a few steps. And this might actually be helpful for people to know a little bit about the history of NISA and how it's transitioned to your role here today. Great, yeah, so so that that transition took place, what, uh, two years and 49 days ago. So we don't ha quite have uh, the, the longevity that, that Mike was alluding yeah, to a moment ago. that is just counting down the days right yeah, there. Just exactly, years, 49, exactly. So I had to think, I did do a little mental math. I could be off by a day or two. Um, but but um, so so relatively recent, you know, uh, by any standards and, and, and fresh in mind. But maybe I'll give a little background on, on NISA. So NISA was really, was never what I'd call family held. In fact, I guess as a, as a nice shout out to, to the Olin School really was founded um, I'll say effectively purchased, but you can say founded in 94 uh, by two former professors uh, from the Olin School, actually. So uh, Jess Yowitz and, and Bill Marshall. And so, and, and they remained owners. And then over time, there started to be a clear combination of ownership transition occurring while staying in, I'll call G1, um, because they were still running the company. And, and Mike had a really great point of the difference between ownership and leadership. And, and what's not one nice thing about an organization when you're private, you don't really have to worry much about what titles actually mean ver and, and versus what people do every day. And so I'd say our leadership transition started, well, 10 years ago at least, but that's the beauty of it. I don't actually know when it started and I don't know, you know, maybe I, I don't even know when it ended because Jess still comes in the office some days these days. So, so, so that's gone on for a while, but two years ago was when we made the official ownership change. We're now, you know, where Jess and Bill are no longer owners of, of NISA. And that's what I refer to as the gen one to gen two transfer that I think, and maybe it's just because of recency, I think is, I think has to be the hardest one to pull off in, in my mind. Um, and, and, one, I think over time, they'll, in a, an employee-owned firm, there'll be less clear integers, right? It, it's, it, we have much more of a laddered portfolio of owners now. Um, and so, so over time, I don't know if it'll be as clear G, G2 to G, G3 as it was from, from the first gen to second gen. But, you know, I think a key part of making, I do think it's tricky. So many of the companies in our, that were privately held, like we were and, and closely held, um, either went public or, or sold to private equity or what have you instead of moving on to G2. And so the first point I'd have to make is there has to be a willingness of both generations to make this happen. And, and, and that's a combination of, you know, G1 has to be willing to take a deferred payout or a different form of structure of how they're going to leave as opposed to cash on the barrel head that would come from an outright sale or something close to ca cash on the barrel head. And so there has to be a, a true willingness. And there also has to be a belief in, in the next leadership group, right? If, if you're the first generation and you don't believe you built the right leaders, you, you probably want to sell and get out, right? And so, so there has to be really alignment in, in what the value values of the organization going forward and and it was interesting to hear hear george's example I, I guess the one thing i'm not i'm not surprised the employees ended up being the best bid because um when, when they were going through the, the the bankruptcy proceedings because the way i described often what happened and i think if jess were here i think he described it the same way where what, what happened to make our transition work was it's not that we didn't have every investment banker coming through and saying, here's what we could sell you for and what have you. And those numbers have been out there and they, they still will come through if, well, if anyone traveled anymore, but they still would love to talk to us um, as a relatively large privately held firm. Every time we saw a number placed out there, I would view it as what we saw very clearly was an enormous information asymmetry of a buyer putting a discount on what we thought our true market value was. And we were unwilling to accept that, the, the collective we, G1, G2. And so what I think we did is we took that, in the, that enormous discount or meaningful discount uh, that comes from an information asymmetry of a private equity buyer or whomever, and we divvied it up 
between the two generations. I think as a result, the, the generation that was retiring um, got a much larger payout over time and a much larger value. And we retain the company and we have something that's value. And we didn't give what we built over time away to a private equity shop, frankly, um, or whomever it was. And I think that's a key. I think you have to have that mindset, but you have to have patience because that doesn't get paid on that day of the transaction two years ago, 49 days ago, it gets paid over time. Yeah, patience and trust that the business is set up to succeed downstream, that the long-term play makes a lot of sense. All right, so this is somewhat related to this point, but I was talking to one of my neighbors who uh, spends some time with you in the day-to-day -day work, and he was talking about some of your love in particular for the book, The Founder's Mentality, and the idea of trying to build up some level of um, essentially long-term founder's mentality, even as the founder changes. So this book was uh, written by a few folks out of Bain and Company. Uh, they were looking at the success of those that have been able to maintain something about the founder's mentality. Sometimes it's in the form of the founder still being around as, uh, as a company transitions. Uh, sometimes it's just about the mentality going from generation one to generation two. How do you think about the role of the founder's mentality being in play inside NISA today and how you lead that process as the leader of the firm? Yeah, so you've done good research, uh, an insider scoop on, on NISA to be sure. Um, I, I don't read many books of that nature, um, right, wrong, or indifferent, but I, I was pretty enamored with, with it uh, because it struck a lot of chords with me. And, and the founder's mentality, the concept is really trying to design a company public, private, what have you, where every employee has an ownership mindset. And so there's a little irony of, you know, a big portion of our, of our employees have ownership. So why do I need to instill an ownership mindset? You think that would be automatic. Um, but I think that in certain ways it is, and I think that gives us a head start on it. But, but I think the challenge always is, is, you know, we have had a lot of growth. We're still in so many ways, such a small business, you know, 350 employees, et cetera. But we've had a lot of growth over the last 10 plus years, for sure. And what they point out in that book is what they describe as the paradox of growth, right? And so, so and they use these really evocative words that, that I, I tend to like, that most successful uh, small businesses start with some sort of insurgent mission. And, and I really think we in our industry have an insurgent mission. We have a, a mission coming back to being tied directly to our clients, listening to them and designing things we actually believe in versus just selling financial products. And we always had that and may, we got lucky as much as anything, but that's worked well. And as that's grown and the paradox of growth comes back, as you have growth like that, growth inherently breeds size definitionally, but, but also a huge corollary to that is organizational complexity and internal challenges because of all of that growth, particularly if it's reasonably rapid as ours has been. And as a result with that complexity, that that stymies the, the nimility, uh, um, uh, the nimble nimbleness, excuse me, the nimbleness of making up words, the nimbleness of the organization um, and the willingness and really what that, that insurgent mission was often gets lost in bloat. And so, so the concept of that founder's mentality are, are what are the different ways where you can inject to everyone in the firm that ownership man mentality to where they really feel like they have in their little domain the, the ability to, to um, act like an owner, do what's just right as an organization. And I think, you know, that comes, I, I, uh, George used a really similar term. I used to refer to NISA when we were small. It was, a, 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 I, I use the term like uh, central planning, you know, like, you know, like how, how, how uh, China runs their economy. It was very centrally planned at NISA. And that made sense. As you get bigger, that's impossible. And so you need to somehow do, truly not delegate task, but delegate that ownership mindset and the ability to just get things done because I'm not smart enough and can't be everywhere to know what's going on around the organization. And that's really been, a, and it's been really great for us to have adopted that. So Here, Mike, I could. go ahead, yeah, please do. Yeah, so I wanna jump in on, uh, so two themes that have, uh, I've heard, um, one of the things that Dave just mentioned. Uh, so one is size and the other is alignment. So, uh, you know, I think what Dave is talking about is a, is a privately held company, whether it's uh, employee owned or family owned, I think tip, you, you often find there's a certain scale that goes with it. Now, of course, you could have, you know, there are really huge family owned and, uh, and that Newberger is a pretty large company as well. 
But you know, we feel I think kind of like Dave is saying that our size is our is to our advantage. Uh, we have a, the scale as a bank to, to you know have all the services, the technology, et cetera. But we're not so big that we create this bureaucracy. Now, it's something that that's not doesn't just automatically come to you. You don't have to work for be work to be nimble. You have to work to be nimble to make sure the bureaucracy uh, doesn't get in the way or doesn't you know start to control things. Uh, but that is something I think that's really important to us. And you know the founders' mentality. I mean, we have again. My dad is not he's not generation one, but in many ways he is. We can view him as a founder because he's really the one who, who uh, made it as what it is today and as big as it is. Um, but, you know, so he, he, he's still with us. He's on the board of the bank. He's retired from day to day, but he's still there, you know, very present. And the family is very present in the company. And I think what this helps do is it creates this alignment that both George uh, and Dave have talked about that I think is central to this, which is that whether it's an employee-owned company or a family-owned company, you have this alignment because you have owners who are there with, with everyone in the company. Uh, and that is really important uh, in terms of setting goals and making sure that there's, you know, a clarity around those goals uh, and also making sure that, you know, it sort of fosters this long-term perspective because unlike, you know, in a publicly traded context, all the shareholders know, the publicly traded shareholders know is then what that was in the quarterly results. And they're using the quarterly results as a reflection of what they think the future is going to bring. Uh, but if you're in the company, whether it's the family or the an employee ownership context, you have this natural alignment because you as a member of the team, being part of the team uh, in the company, you get to see what's going on. You get to see the sausage being made. And so you don't have to just rely on quarterly results as the indicator of what the future holds. You know, you might know and you should know that, well, maybe this quarter wasn't, isn't going to be great, but that's because we're making these investments for the future. Uh, and that alignment is really important. And George brought it to not just the alignment between the employees, uh, you know, executive leadership team and the ownership, but to the clients. Uh, and I would even take it further that to the community. So we, when we talk about our mission statement, our mission statement is very much focused on the, the symbiotic relationship between us, uh, you know, our, our clients and the community. And I'm sure George and Dave would probably feel that way too, that, uh, you know, we are a function and outgrowth of our community. We depend on the community for our success uh, and our success can tra translate to for the benefit of our communities so that we as, a, as family owners and then we as a company are really, you know, we want to commit to, to making this, whether it's St. Louis or other, com or other communities we serve, to make them as, as successful as we could possibly make them. Great. So let me see if I can build upon this point a bit. And I think this is actually a helpful distinction. Uh, with how we might think about the different models here, but also some similarities between the two. So you heard Dave mention this idea around ownership mentality. And in fact, the need to be able to make sure that people that are actually owners still have the mentality of ownership. In contrast in family owned businesses, imagine that I work at First Bank and I am a mid, to, uh, I was gonna say mid to high, let's just call me a mid level employee, mid to low level employee inside First Bank. And I'm not an owner but you still want to create a level of ownership mentality for me inside the organization. And this is especially complicated, I'm sure, not as you're a single branch bank as you were in the 1960s, but now you're across five or six different state lines. How do you think about making sure that a person like Peter working inside First Bank feels that level of ownership inside the organization, even if that ownership is not financial ownership? So first, I want to take a step back and say that um, for myself, uh, and for the family, we, we actually try not to think of ourselves as owners. Uh, we try to view ourselves as stewards. Uh, mm -hmm. So while we're, we're, while we're encouraging our employees to think as owners, uh, in many ways, we also, you know, ourselves think about it as, as stewards. And the distinction I would draw is that, you know, an owner has the power to destroy. Uh, and a steward doesn't look at it that way. It's something they've received now. It may, they may have received it through their hard work, through luck, whatever it is, and probably a lot of hard work. Uh, but it is not necessarily theirs to, to destroy. It's something that they, 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 they make the best of before passing it on. And I could be passing it on in a context of a sale to others, because maybe that's the best uh, you know, uh, you know, destination for the business, or maybe it is to the next generation. But I mean, that's the kind of mentality I think you see among family-owned businesses. And I think also to uh, you know, an employee-owned as well is really this it's sort of beyond ownership. It's a focus on stewardship, uh, but that's kind of a 
maybe it's, it can be a, 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 a hard topic or hard concept to get your arms around. And so taking it back to this idea of the, the ownership, how do you instill that within the company? I mean, obviously there are things like incentive plans uh, that you can use to kind of align, you, you, you do the best you can to align interests throughout the company. But I think, you know, all of us um, know that there's no perfect incentive plan uh, that is going to align interests. And so what's important is that through the, you know, involvement of leadership of the company uh, and to some extent the family to make sure that they know that if there's something about an incentive plan that is sort of pointing in short term uh, and there's a, you know, there might be a conflict between the short term interests uh, and what your incentive plan might point to and the long term, we try to instill the value that you really should be focused on doing what's doing what's right in the long term. Um, and I think that also, I mean, the, the, I mean, I think we've seen over the last decade, two decades, whatever, is growing uh, view of of looking at it not just from like we serve to we 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 are we as a company are there to serve the shareholders, but broadening out that definition, uh, and that's where kind of serving the community comes into play as well. That. Uh, I think you foster this mentality by showing by by sort of laying out that connection between our success uh, and the success of the communities, and I think people really engage around that. That it's not just about oh, hey, let's let's make more money for this family, uh, but you know you know we can see that the the things we are doing are helping the communities, they're helping our clients. Good. So I, I want to pick up on this theme of community a bit and hear it from from Dave, your perspective, from Nissa's perspective in this regard. Uh, but in some ways, NISA is unique uh, in the sense that it is based in St. Louis. There probably would have been some opportunities to run the shop out of New York or other larger markets. Now, it was great to hear from George the fact that this is, I think he said, and I'm going to quote him on this at some point later on, the second most important city for his business. Um, but nonetheless, I'd like to hear a little bit about how uh, how NISA in particular sees community in maybe a similar way or different way from what we heard from Mike. Is uh, St. Louis critical, a critical dynamic to the importance of the functioning of your business? How do you see the, the intersection of the two? Yeah, I, I, St. Louis is actually, it is quite critical, for, but probably for reasons um, you, you almost wouldn't guess. Um, so, so, you know, unlike, you know, George's organization, we have no retail high net worth channel. So, so also we have some great retail and, and shops, as he pointed out in, in St. Louis, they're quite enormous. Um, we don't call on any of them. That's, that's not a conduit of, of how we, we win business. Um, and so from an asset management perspective, there really isn't a lot in St. Louis, you know, we're, we're, you know, there, there's us and a couple other shops. So in that sense, you'd say, you know, we're, we're, are we in a wasteland? Why haven't we moved to New York or Chicago or what have you by, by now? Um, and, and we've purposely been in St. Louis from day one. It's not that we couldn't have gotten, gotten up and left, but why I think it's so important is, you know, and having worked a little bit in New York, and actually I do really, I love New York in a lot of ways. Um, we do think there's a group think mentality uh, in finance. I think there's, I think we've really been happy to, we get the benefit of knowing of, of, of sophistication because of the clients that we have. We don't feel like we have to be in the, the New York epicenter. And I think that's, I think we've probably been saved from ourselves in certain ways on that. When that managers were doing CLOs and various things in 2006, seven, eight, it sounded just bizarre to us and, and we didn't understand it. And I think it's probably because we weren't inside, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the however many square miles of Manhattan. And so I think that's allowed us to be fiercely independent. Um, that probably sounds more, um, uh, antagonistic than I mean it to, you know, relative to New York. But I, I do think there's just been a, a, a beauty of recruiting here, living here. We've, you know, comes into the, the work-life balance. We you know, obviously, we talk a lot about DEI these days, but our industry is not great on work-life balance. And that, that has a lot of issues uh, uh, um, to have a truly inclusive environment. I think this has been exceptional on work-life balance. And we've, from day one, you know, you work here to have a life, not vice versa. And, and so that's been a big part of it. And I think that's, you know, you know where we are in Clayton. There, there, you can, there's no reason to have more than a five minute commute. You can choose to have it, but you don't have to, right? That's almost impossible in, in something like a New York or Chicago. So, so we really do a lot of things. I think that, that St. Louis has allowed us to have a very unique cultural 
uh, a collegiality, um, I think. Not to say it can't be accomplished. Clearly, Newberger seems to have accomplished it in New York. I just think the deck stacked against you in, in some other environments. Um, and then from a community, what also, the, maybe the last thing is, we do have some clients, some large institutions in St. Louis, but 95% of our clients aren't in St. Louis. So again, being here geographically does nothing for us, but for, we think we recruit great talent. Folks who want to live in St. Louis, want to stay in St. Louis. Our retention is extraordinary on, 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 uh, on clients, but also I meant on employees. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that when you've self-selected into St. Louis and being at NISA, you, you really don't want to be uh, uh, move your commute to New York at some point in your career. You've chosen to be here. Yeah, it's interesting to see, to some degree, some of the same dynamics happening in the venture capital world, a world that I pay attention to on the, uh, on the research front. Uh, people that are saying, I love being in Silicon Valley, but cost of living is crazy. I feel like I'm in this herd mentality. I'm running after deals that maybe I shouldn't, but they seem attractive by virtue of everyone I know talking about those things. And so this migration recently towards Austin, an underlying question of whether it'll essentially create the same sort of bubble just down a little bit further south. But nonetheless, place does have a pretty important impact on the way that we think about our business, the way that we actually live it out in practice. So I want to transition a little bit back to the internal dynamics of an organization. Again, building upon this Founders Mentality book, which I finished last night in preparation for today. Uh, one of the things they talked about in this book, and in fact, Mike, this is going to come back to you in a second. Um, but these two authors essentially said, we focus a lot on what happens externally that changes in our market that causes failure. In fact, their earlier two books focused on, on this. And so perhaps the model around retail banking changes or higher education landscape, something we think about quite a bit could change such that having a beautiful brick and mortar campus is different in terms of a value proposition downstream. But they said what was in fact more important for failure, more causing a failure was some of those internal dynamics that can essentially drag down an organization, whether it's bureaucracy or power and politics that can actually pull away from the effectiveness of getting things done. So here's the question for you on this, Mike. You mentioned uh, in an earlier exchange how you think political behavior might function differently inside a family-oriented business, family-owned business. Uh, I wonder if you've given that a bit more thought. How do you think power and politics, the dynamics uh, that can create some dysfunction inside a business, function at a family-owned shop versus let's say, an uh, um, um, employee-owned or a um, publicly traded shop? Is it, does it look different in your world? And are there things that you as a leader have to do to mitigate some of those downsides? Well, first, I mean, so I have to say as a disclaimer that I've never worked in an employee-owned firm. That's, I can't, it's hard for me to do the, the contrast. I, what I don't know is, um, and I have wondered this, and I've you know, had this discussion with other family-owned businesses, whether we have more issues of conflict, politics, et cetera, than, than other firms have. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I do, what I do know that is, that seems pretty clear is there's a different element to this in a, in a family owned business. So what you have in a family owned business is this, you have the family, uh, right? In the midst of the business. And uh, how that makes it different is that the family, you know, uh, David, uh, so he has, he wears two hats. He has the owner hat and he has the, you know, leader, uh, executive hat. Uh, in a family owned business, you have the, the sort of employee leader hat, you have the owner hat, and then you have the, the family hat. Uh, and that can be all be blended, um, whether intentionally or not. Uh, and you can have issues um, that are family issues. Let's say it could be something that goes back to when you were kids, something like you, something that happened when you were 12, right? And then there's a business question and you might, there might be, some, some conflict in the business where other people in the business are wondering, what is this all about? Well, the answer is it's about something that happened when they were kids, or maybe it's something that happened the other day over dinner. Um, so that is, that is not something you tend to have happen in uh, other businesses, whether it's publicly traded uh, you know, or employee owned. Uh, and so that, that is a challenge. Uh, and that might be one of the greatest challenges for family owned businesses is dealing with that kind of conflict. Um, and, you know, we talk about how you deal with that. It's, a, you know, there's a lot to it and it's not a simple, easy answer, but I mean, some of it is you basically have to recognize um, when the, this is being brought, when the family issue is being brought in 
to a business question and try to separate it as much as possible so that, you know, the things that happen when you were kids or the, th you know, the things that happened at dinner uh, a week ago, that those aren't affecting the business relationship. Uh, I and mean, the other thing you, we can, you can see in a family business, you know, we talk about conflict. You could have too much conflict. You can have conflict that is like of a personal nature. Uh, but sometimes the opposite of that occurs where you have conflict avoidance, where it's like in, in the spirit of bringing harmony to the family, you avoid making difficult decisions. Uh, and that is, you know, that's not going to work, right? So that's not healthy for the business to avoid these difficult decisions. You need to be able to have those discussions. Um, and so, you know, for, for that, it's a matter of having the discussions in the right way, having everybody recognize that you're going to have to have some of these discussions uh, and try and keep it in on the, on the uh, you know, on the business topic and not have family issues blend in. So that's the, that's the negative uh, of it, I guess. But I do think that there is this positive that um, as, a, as a family owned company, you can create an environment that is conducive to good relationships in general, to collegiality that Dave was talking about. I mean, it's not exclusive to family businesses, but, you know, uh, but I think there is this opportunity to create a great environment that putting aside the, the, the family to family uh, conflict that as an overall uh, organization that it can be a, a really well run organization, they have a great culture where people can feel this family feel uh, in the organization. The family feel is not necessarily just the literal family, but like the broader family. And again, that's not exclusive to family owned businesses, but I think it is something it's a great opportunity uh, for family-owned businesses to capitalize on on creating a, a family feel in this really close-knit uh, environment that you know kind of relates to the size. I mean, there is an element of how size can help create that, um, but I think also the family can play a role in that. Yeah. So, Dave, I want to uh, walk back to your world for a bit. In fact, there's some nice ties in here to some of the comments that Mike just mentioned, but. You've been able to see uh, NISA grow. I don't know how large NISA was when you first showed up, but it wasn't the 300 plus employees that you are now. Um, and in fact, this book, which you've spent some time with, suggests that one of the challenges is that as you grow, it becomes more and more complex. So I'm curious to some degree where you've noticed complexity creeping in that you've had to mitigate, what you've done to kind of mitigate those downsides. And what you think you need to do as a leader, the group needs to do, the ownership group, et cetera, needs to do to make sure that as NISA grows, if NISA wants to become larger in terms of assets under management or larger in terms of number of employees, you really find ways to weed out the kind of complexity or bureaucracy or power and politics that can come with that level of growth. Well, there's, there's a lot there. Um, so, so I started at NISA uh, in 1999. So to put in perspective, we had uh, 13 billion in assets and we're a little, we're over 400 billion now. So that's kind of the, the growth in a little over 20 years. Um, so, so, so that's been a, a obviously, a, we, we were thrilled with that. Growth is not a direct objective of NISA. Of course, we want growth, but that's not our, not, we don't set our, our, our target or what have you. Uh, we, we do really believe if we do kind of right by our clients, the growth just happens and well, it's happened. I think with that type of growth, you know, I'll, I'll come back to the point I made earlier. I think that centrally planned economy approach to running a business um, mm -hmm. is, is great uh, early on in many ways. And, and that worked certainly in 99. And I don't know if that worked in 2005 and 10 and what have you, but increasingly that's not going to work. And I think the key a key, I wouldn't, one great thing about this is we, we do not have a political structure. I don't know if that's purely because of the ownership or frankly, because of the people we have and how we approach things and the openness and what have you. Um, but, but we don't have a, a political environment that creates issues that we're quote, trying to get ahead and, and willing to stab somebody in the back. But what, but what you can have in, you know, along the way of growth like that is just simply folks who are accustomed to making certain decisions and, and being, I'll say, a, a bottleneck or become a bottleneck as opposed to helpful in making decisions and not as easily delegating uh, true responsibility and true authority across the firm. And I think that's a, we are control freaks by nature because of what we do. Uh, we manage other people's money. We're fiduciaries. And we really, that word means a lot to us, right? We put their interests ahead of ours. And so as a result, it's hard for all of us to concede control of anything, running our business and so forth, because of the responsibility we have for the assets that we're, we're, we're entrusted with. 
And I think that creates the organizational complexity that worries me or has worried me and really why we wanted to stay ahead of that. And, and I feel like we have, um, but, but it's a constant battle. Um, and again, so it's not a political battle per se, it's really just a, a battle of saying, at what point do we need to really each individual d divest their responsibility and their decision-making authority to others and where we need to have a, a grassroots approach to, to solving problems. Um, and, and I think the last important point on the ownership side is we talked about G1 and G2, you know, that's a pretty big step function from original founders, et cetera. We've really gone out of our way. We're not as diversified as, as I, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately for right now, but we're not as diversified as, as, as George's firm, um, but we're making a lot of progress. And, and the key, we're, we're bond geeks at heart. We really do have a, a laddered portfolio of, of owners at this point. I mean, laddered in ages, uh, much more so than we certainly had historically. And, you know, it, your age aligns with your growth mindset, your horizon, et cetera. And that's critical to making sure you don't have a bunch of old owners who are like, let's just keep this thing afloat for a little while until we get out the door. And the flip side of it, you don't want a lot of young folks to treat a, a stable business like it's a VC business, right? No, no, we've got a great business. We do have a, a, a great Horizon One business that has to be melded with, with longer term ideas. We've really done a nice job. I think we're working on it further to have a laddered age of, of owners so that we have appropriate Horizon alignment. And that's been a key part as well. So I'm going to end with one final rapid fire question for you both. And in particular, we have a lot of owners of business on the line that might be in the five to $50 million of revenue space. They're not quite as large as both of your shops. If you were to take one principle, one idea and encourage the leaders of those organizations to try and to test in their own organizations, what would it be? What has worked for you that you think might be worth trying out there? We'll start quickly with Mike and then end with Dave. I think for us, it's been having a, uh, an outside board so, uh, you know, having, you know, some members of the board, uh, in, our, in our case, it's depending on the year, it's either majority of the board members, but they're independent board members, great board members. I do think it really helps to have this outside perspective. I mean, we like to think that the family brings a lot of value to the table, to the company, uh, but it also does help to have somebody on the outside taking a look. And then when, when you have issues that are family issues, then to have some independence, I think can, can really help whether it's succession planning or, or really a host of topics, I think that helps. Uh, so I would say outside help, whether it's independent board or just somebody on the outside who can help you handle and navigate some of the waters of a family owned business. Love it. What about for you, Dave? What's the one thing you'd want them to try and test? Uh, you know, I, I think it's just the, that, you know, we're probably at a different business than many of the businesses you're, you're, you know, that are on the line today, but, but, the client obsession and focus or client centricness um, that to me, that's a, the, the criticality of, of growing a business. And, and it, and it sounds obvious, but, but really re reminding all employees all the time, we're here to serve clients. And through that, that's where everything, everything emanates from that. Um, to me, that's, that's the one comment I would share. Great. Well, thanks to you both for sharing the insights and thanks George for your insights earlier on. This has been incredibly helpful for us to think through what this looks like both in financial service, but I think broadly outside of this sector altogether. It has been a pleasure to have both of you on the call. Um, and uh, again, wanna thank you for engaging with our community, both students and members of the broader WashU friends and family. Thank you, Peter. My pleasure, thanks. Great, and I wanna thank uh, the panel as well. Oh, great, great job. Very stimulating conversation around. I, I really like this idea of the ownership mindset and the stewardship mindset, which is, I think that's a, a potential future topic for us to think through. Um, and I also wanna certainly thank George and Spencer for a great first hour uh, kind of highlighting a lot of these same issues, particularly for me, this notion of aligning family, firm, employee, client, and then uh, kind of the last part that I think was raised in the panel, community, which is something that I think family businesses often are more focused on. And that really tees up uh, our session next Thursday at 8 a.m. Um, I don't think there are businesses that are more focused on aligning with the uh, community than our professional sports franchises, uh, St. Louis Cardinals, St. Louis Blues, and the upcoming St. Louis City Soccer Club will have the owners, Carolyn Kendall-Betts, uh, William DeWitt, and Tom Stillman 
coming to talk with us about about culture and their family businesses that are so important to so many of us in St. Louis and in the region and the United States as a whole. So I look forward to seeing everybody, uh, having everybody join us next week, uh, next Thursday at eight o'clock and have a great day. Thank you very much for joining us today.